Someone once said, Why are we here? And no one could answer the question. What happened to us? What happened to our dreams and our hopes, our aspirations for being more than what we are? Do you even know who you are anymore? made us so angry and upset? What made us change the way we are? Who are we? So many of us have so much, but then there's so many of us that slip through the cracks. This film is about them. I saw these kids sitting around at this agency and after questioning them and trying to get into their mind, I found that there were a whole lot of unanswered questions about living, about going forward, how to achieve, what success means, how to get it, how to go for it. And I started in my conversation asking them questions about how they live, where they live, with whom they live, and so forth. And I found a lot of broken hearts, shattered dreams, and empty promises, and things that weren't fulfilled in their lives. And I, I wanted to make a difference in that. I wanted to give them some hope, some reason for getting to the next day, to a, a reason to live. You know, a lot of them come to you, you know, world weary at the age of 14, um, disgusted and criminal minded at this particular point when they should be starting out, they should still be living or discovering what life can ultimately be about. So I got them to talk about things that they didn't like about society, guns, gangs, violence, teen pregnancy, school, teachers, parents, all of the things that affect their life, the world, war, peace, the things that um, have people at odds, not building anything. I wanted them to feel like they could be a part of something, like I felt a part of something. When I'm quiet, they get angry. When I talk, they get mad. I wish I was deaf, blind, and me. So I would have to hear, speak, nor see the bull. You ask me, what's my problem? And of course, I say nothing. Cause I'm not in the mood for you when you're done bugging. You tell me to shut up, and I'm sorry. That is something I can and will not do. So why don't you take your own advice and shut your trap up too? If you don't like it, you pack your bags and you get out! Growing up as a kid, yeah, at the age of three I was singing already. You know, I decided, you know, like being Filipino, every child had to be a doctor, had to be a nurse, had to, had to be a pharmacist, but no, I'm sorry, that was not what was my calling in this earth, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I'm a performer as well as, you know, a carpenter and, you know, whatever else, you know, I do here, you know, just putting stuff together, cleaning stuff. But, um, being a performer, um, yeah, my parents did get me into the arts, more, more or less my father. I mean, my art, my mom supported me, 
but my father was the one that really just got me into it, you know. Um, he, he forced me to sing. He, we did a lot of singing, mostly singing, and you know, he loved music. You know, and I and that's what I was under, and you know, I loved it too. So basically, that he um, it was under sort of my father's guidance. You know, it wasn't necessarily it wasn't professional. You know, he's the one that told my mom, you know, give him voice lessons. You know, get him here, get him there. And you know, that's one thing about my dad. It was like uh, he really believed in me as a performer, no matter what. He just loved uh, seeing me perform. I mean, of course, there were definitely ups and a lot of downs. But, you know, that's something I can't trade away, was the support of my father, no matter what. You know, of course he would discourage me at the same time, trying to be real. But you know what? If you're a performer, that's what it is about, being real. But it's making your dream real. So that's, that's what makes the difference. is based a lot on my um, the way I was raised and where I was raised who I was raised with and it it, it was like I was when I was younger and I would write I would just it would just come to my mind and it's kind of like a gift and a curse because when it comes it just comes I have to write it down there's been times when I wrote on receipt papers, I've wrote on my bed sheets, I've wrote on my hands, I've wrote on walls, I wrote on desk, I wrote on my bags. It's something that just comes, but once it finished pouring out, it's, it's a gift. They made us lab rats. No, y'all made us lab rats. You birthed us in the smallest apartments, raised us in the tiniest projects, taught us in the cramped classrooms, shoved us in the most microscopic, pitiful, pocket-sized ghettos a child could fit in, then you tell me to dream big. You say reach for the moon when you yourself have never touched a star. Whatever I am is whoever you are. I'm every regret, shame, and mistake you do. Stop worrying about my generation and fix you. Parents always want what's best for their children. There's no foundation, no life. So what future was you building? I still talk to her to this day. She, we had like um, a section that we had to do about class and it was about poetry. And then she asked everyone to write their own poem. And I had wrote a small little poem, something not important, just something to express how I felt at the time. And she told me it was really good. She liked it. She liked it a lot. Um, I didn't really like it, but you know, we, we had to read our stuff. I read it. It was fine. But then I was like, writing is fun. Maybe if I write, I could write about, you know, that bird that I saw out at the window. I could write about my life. So, I mean, junior high school, seventh grade, eighth grade, I started to write about the children that I, I saw, the things I saw, because I went to junior high school, David Ruggles, 258, and Bethel Stuyvesant. It was different, you know, different kids, people I never saw before. They lived different lives than mine. So I used to write about them. It was like... They would express it, they would feel it, and then they would give it back to me, to me in, in, in their words, in the ways that they could make me understand how they were really feeling. You know, and we really, really appreciate you. So if you're going through it, know that we love you. You know, we love you. And we, you know, we're laughing because you make us, you make us laugh. 
and you have such a light that you don't want anything to impede that. So if you stutter, if you falter, that's okay. We are here for you. We will pick you up and we will carry you. Don't you even worry about it. I'm tired of being bounced around. I'm tired of standing strong. My energy is going down. Everyone tell me that they're going to help me, but when I need help, no one's around. I wake up crying. I go to sleep wishing that I die. And I keep asking why, but no one has answers for me. So what? I'm pretty. So what? I'm smart. I've been born with this from the start, but I still have pain. And I feel like no matter what I do, I'll never gain the happiness that I see everyone has. You guys keep telling me, progress, progress, and I'm still stuck in the past. All I want is love. I don't care about money. I want to walk down the street happy and realize that people are not looking at me funny. What did I do? How did I mess up your life? Why everything that I try to make right goes wrong? And then at the end of the day, I still have people telling me, be strong, don't give up. You don't understand what the things that I go through. You ask what's the problem, but you really don't give a fuck. I'm trying to be somebody, not because of you, but because of me. But deep down inside, I feel as if I will never be happy. I was always the yes man. Yes, I did anything that you wanted me to do. But why can nobody be here for me? Why can't you be here for me? Like, I need you. I'm there. You call, I answer my phone. Why am I surrounded by light, but I still feel alone? I'm crying and I'm screaming. I just really need help. I was born into this world alone, but why do I have to live by myself? From my mom's house to my dad's house, from my dad's house to my mother's house. I'm the oldest and I'm trying to set an example. But I keep hearing no and my life is something that I can't handle. I'm ready to give up. But you can't. I have nothing to live for and I'm tired of people telling me that I'm going to be somebody. I can't take it anymore. You don't understand my pain. You don't and I come here and I laugh. And that's what we want you to do. That's what we want you to do. We all connected through some type of pain. And it's, um, it's really, it's sad in a way, because when I think about it, that's like how the majority of the world connects. Everybody felt, has felt a certain pain at a point, whether you pricked your finger or you got beat up or some, something happened to you, you felt pain at a point. And for the like for where we are now as people and as a country and as a world, like that's sad that the only way everyone can connect is through pain. And we noticed that when we came here, I like I noticed that I'm like, wow, that's really strong, but that's not right. Like why is it that we only can connect through pain? Why is it that I only could be friends with you because I know you went through what I went through? Or you went through something similar that I went through, and you're hurting, and I'm hurting, and we have, and that's the bond we share. And it kind of amazed me, like, wow, that's really, that like, I don't know how to explain it, but it hurts. Who I be there, who I be there, who if I hold up my peace, I'll be there. Now if my mind is made up and my heart is dead up, if I hold up my peace, I'll be there. And when we all get together, we see the light and show all the world we care. I know if I try my hardest and do what's right, I will meet my God in the air. Oh, if I hold up my peace and I hold up my joy, if I hold up my peace, I'll be there. Now if my mind is made up and my heart lifted up, if 
I came just to help out and to be supportive of, you know, the new project HAI and George were doing. And I love children and youth and have worked with a lot of um, at-risk youth throughout life. And they weren't all at risk, but everybody was teenage, adolescents and had issues. And I was the motherly part and George was the more disciplinary uh, part at p points and times. And we, we ended up playing off of each other and uh, providing them with an environment that challenged them, nurtured them, confronted them. Um, I, my background and training is in theater um, and drama therapy. So a lot of, uh, George would bring up a lot of issues that stimulated conversation and tears and pain and they would write and uh, I would help them with their um, acting around their writing and also take them through various exercises um, to help them process and cope with and role play and deal with some of the issues that were really, really deep seated that they have not dealt with. So um, he would get it started and I would do some of the processing with him. My dance teacher, Miss Kimberly Pugh, she just runs up in the lunchroom and says, Daryl, Daryl, we have people here that you want you to audition for. Because she was one of the few people that knew I could sing. So I decided to, you know, come out and audition for the Respect Project with George Faison. And at first I really didn't think I was good enough, but you know, obviously George saw a lot of potential in me. And it was history from there. I mean, I took everything day by day and I learned so hard to perfect my craft and not only perfect my singing but also my piano playing and my dancing and my acting and I'm just doing little by little to, you know just to better myself and like George used to tell me all the time he used to sit me down and say you know Daryl you're gonna be something someday and he was the first person to ever say that to me and it made me want to stick with it even when things got hard things got rough and I didn't understand it made me want to stick with it and basically, you know, it just changed my life. You know, it just allowed me to use my art form and my craft as an outlet to become a better person and shape into a better man. Like 
next thing you know, ass people melting and hanging. From there, yo, what's up? Now, hello, Ty, I know this. I'm a child of the ghetto. This is my hood right here. This is where I live. This is where I was born and I was raised. And this is where I'm the most comfortable <laughs> at. Okay, well, it's a little... It's a little messy, but we have good days. No, we don't. We do. All right, come on in. What was happening was they trying to, like, fix the... You know. We all, I guess, suffer from the same thing. And that is when we're young, trying to get somebody to take us seriously, somebody to listen to us, somebody that we can talk to, and express our ideas with. And that was my whole reason for starting the Respect Project, because there was a disconnect. I was born in 3A. There was too many of us in one place, because this is really a one apartment barrel. And remember, there was a ton of us, and it was getting bigger and bigger. So we moved, not across the block, not across the street, but across the hall. 3H and we still live there, so a lot of us, but it's two bedrooms and my mom's very creative. She turned the living room into a bedroom, so you know, each room has, my room has three beds. We share our beds. The boys now got their own room, because some of us moved out like me. They have bunk beds, so it's still crowded, but you know, we have enough space to go through the hall. Everybody in the world sings every day. Dance does music every day. Not everybody in the world uses all the arts every day, but everybody uses words. See, if your mind is free, nobody can put any chains on you. And those words from the, from the Harlem Renaissance, the words that we could live by today. Black people are prolific. They, they can do anything. You know, they get tired of hearing a beat, they'll invent a new beat. They'll come up with something else. If one invention is cut off, they'll come up with something else. They are always used to making something out of nothing. And now we have, we've gone from, from uh, rhythm and blues, from the blues to rhythm and blues, from, uh, from bebop to hip hop. All of it's the same, it's our own invention. It's all a part of us. You know, that's our future. That's where we're going. And we build a huge edifice for the children. We still have too many adults that are out there in need of work, in need of opportunity. It's not just the children we're trying to save. It's a nation. The Respect Project is afforded me the opportunity to work with young people, but it's afforded me the, the, uh, the uh, opportunity to give Everything that I've gotten from all the people that I've gotten things from, valuable things, like, you know, art, music, plays, poetry, literature, all of the things, and give it to them. Giving, it's like giving them a heads up, you know, a leg up as to what is going to happen as what they can expect from life. So they don't want to be shocked by some of the cruelty that they are going to, to uh, encounter. So that will, that giving them that extra armor will, will ensure that they can combat all the negativity that they ultimately will be confronted with. But I promise you years from now, you're gonna meet another Shadina, you're gonna ask yourself, Who's helping these children that are getting So I woke up very humble and very warm-hearted because 
Six years later, they're still following my life. <laughs> Remember when you recorded me? I was so nervous. Not enough confident because I just, I know this, this is not about me. It's not about how I look. It's not about how I speak. It's not about anything. It's about who I am. Because I need to help this world wake up. And that is my job. So you guys could, everyone else could go and do their nine to fives. Everyone else can go and work for the rest of their life. My job is to make a difference in the world. Uh, if it wasn't for music, I would be, <laughs> I would probably be going the same right now. Um, to sing away my issues, to sing away my problems, it's just the most, I, I honestly think there's nothing I can compare to it. Um, and that's for any artist in there, feel the art. Like, once you care about your gift and your talent, and you really want to do something with it, or you really want to touch someone's life with it, or you really want to impact people with it, the reward to you that you get, whether or not you make a lot of money or not, it it does something different than money can ever do can do for you. A hoodie is as much responsible for Trayvon Martin's death as George Zimmerman was. What do you mean? When you when you see a kid walking, Julia, when you see a kid walking down the street, particularly a, a dark skinned kid like my son Cruz, who I constantly yelled at when he was going out wearing a damn hoodie or those pants around his ankles, take that hood off. People look at you and they what do they what's the instant identification? What's the instant association? Uh -oh. It's those crime scene surveillance tapes. Every time you see someone sticking up a seven eleven, the kids wearing a hoodie. Every time you see a mugging on a surveillance camera, or they get the old lady in the alcove, it's a kid wearing a hoodie. You have to recognize that this whole stylizing yourself as a gangster, you're going to be a gangster wannabe, well people are going to perceive you as a menace. That's what happens. It is an instant reflexive action. Remember Juan Williams, our colleague, our brilliant colleague, he got in trouble with NPR because he said Muslims in formal garb at the airport uh, uh, conjure a certain reaction in him, a response in him. That's a automatic reflex. Juan wasn't defending it. He was explaining that that's what happened when he sees these particular people in that particular place. When you see a black or Latino youngster, particularly on the street, you walk to the other side of the street. You try to avoid that confrontation. Trayvon Martin's, uh, you know, uh, God bless him, he's an innocent kid, a wonderful kid, a box of Skittles in his hand. He didn't deserve to die, but I'll bet you money. If he didn't have that hoodie on, that, uh, that nutty neighborhood watch guy wouldn't have responded and that violent and aggressive what to most people a hoodie is just a garment on one hand it could it could be you know right now in modern times it's like thug life and some of you're doing something devious but go back a couple of centuries who wore the first hoodies? Monks, monasteries, holy people. You put on a hoodie and you are invisible. You are magnified. You are invincible. You don't you can shut out the entire world. A world especially a hostile world. You can find peace in a crowded urban setting when this hoodie that gives you all the powers. We are, we are Americans here. We have, we, li we can live any kind of fantasy that we want, but when we want to shut you out, then put on a hoodie. I don't have to deal with you. I don't have to deal with a lot of things. But when you invade that space that is mine, then we're going to have a difference of opinion. Sometimes I don't even feel like dealing with the world. I put on my hoodie, put my earphones in, and go on about and create a world that's not the world that you're living in and jog, walk, and be at peace maybe.